Good morning. I love the Church of the Harvest family. Do you love your Church of the Harvest family? Church is a family. God is growing a family in the earth. He's growing a family in Olathe, and God's families are always called to be a blessing to all nations. And I see that spirit and that blessing and that legacy here. Pastor David and Pastor Tracy have been uh, key friends and mentors of us in our ministry, and uh, Pastor David takes me on discipleship appointments, also known as flying lessons. We used to get out together, often landing near a golf course. And, uh, um, I want to share a couple of things before I uh, get into my message, but when I was praying for you this weekend, I saw uh, a vision of a well that I believe represented Church of the Harvest, and I saw new waters of life, sp- life springing up in this next season from the harvest, and I saw the waters leaking out of the well. And some are going to start to wonder, but wait, how can we let this go? Isn't it supposed to be here? And I saw the waters of life coming out of the well of the Church of the Harvest and bringing life to many new places. And I saw out of the well, I saw offshoots springing underground and popping up in new cities because of Church of the Harvest. I see the inspiration... I see the inspiration of entrepreneurial ideas. This is an era for kingdom entrepreneurship unlike ever before, and some of you are sitting on ideas and innovations and projects and changing your business and starting new things, and I say, go for it. This is a season for the blessing of God on kingdom entrepreneurship, and I see that and I declare that over this family. And as always, this is also a season for evangelism and reaching the nations. <laughs> that's the operating, that's my prophetic, I got a word for you. This is, it's a time to reach lost people for Jesus. It's like, it's like It's kind of like if you're not a prophet, you can always operate with two upstanding prophetic words. Jesus wants to change the world, and God loves you. You know, I was when I when I was young in the Lord. You know, sometimes you see uh, you see a a gifted prophet or someone gifted in another you know ministry, and you're like, oh man, I wish I was more like that. Anybody ever felt like that? Let me tell you, the most powerful way you can influence the world is to be exactly who God created you to be. I can't tell you how many people I've led to the Lord just by walking up to them and saying, God, you just really stuck out to me, man. I, I don't know why, but I just felt like, I just want to tell you, dude, God loves you. He's got, really got a destiny for you. I'm like, really? I remember one time I was at University of California, Los Angeles, and this six foot six um, starting lineman walks by on Bruin Walk. There's like, I, I don't know, how many, how many of you um, have been to, uh, took classes at a secular college campus? Yay, I love the university campus. University campus is where I started following Jesus. And I believe part of my lifelong call is to be sent to strategize for new movements of the Holy Spirit on the universities of the world. There's 70 million college students on the planet. Only 1% of the world's population. But what happens among that 1% will have more influence on the future of the world and the destiny of the nations than any other demographic on earth. It's to the glory of God to think apostolically for the universities of the world. And so one day I was was walking at UCLA. I was out on Bruin Walk. There's 10,000 students walking by. It's just a mob of ideas and demon-possessed people and credit card companies and just every group you can think of. And and this 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 six foot six African American guy walks by and he just sticks out to me. And so a few minutes later I see him again. I'm like, gosh, I wish I had a word for him. I had nothing. I felt no anointing. I didn't, let me tell you, that you know, it was nothing like that. And so finally I just walked up and I go, hey man, listen, dude, I know this is weird, but dude, you really stuck out to me. And dude, I just wanted to tell you, God loves you. He's he's really on your heart. He's really got an important purpose for your life. He goes, really? This guy was a starting lineman for the UCLA football team. I'm like, yeah, man, did you know that God has a purpose for you? He goes, no, because this is crazy, just last night, I told a friend, I think I, think I need God in my life. And I, I looked down, and I saw that he had a knee brace on. And I said, hey, man, uh, I see you're injured. You know, Jesus has been healing a lot of people lately. Do you want Jesus to heal you? <laughs> Sometimes it helps to share a testimony first, you know? Like, Jesus has been healing a lot of people, you know? He goes, yeah, so I pray for his knee, and he starts wiggling. He goes, dude, it feels numb. What the heck? What the heck? He goes, who are you people? 
It's like, I love, I love being like a skinny white evangelist because it's like, you know, like sneaking up on people of different ethnicities and they're like, you know, it's like, I got nothing going for me culturally, you know? It's not like, hey man, you know, what's up? You know, it's nothing, you know? It's just, it's just Jesus, you know? So I'm, I'm like, uh, I go, man, I'm just a follower of Jesus. Do you want to become one of his followers too? He's like, yeah. So we go to lunch and he gets saved and he gives his life to Jesus, all from a prophetic word that God loves you and he's got a purpose for your life. So I give you permission to use that prophetic word anytime, okay? Well, I was sad. My, my wife, Jennifer, and our four kids couldn't be with us. My wife's home uh, with kids fighting colds, but I thought the second best option was to show you a picture from Thrive Creative Studio. My wife, Jen. Ethan is nine, Olivia is seven, Hudson is five, and Graham is three. And uh, one of our passions as a, a family is to really um, to lead a movement on the university campuses as a family. Whenever possible, we made our, up our minds four years ago that as much as possible, we would travel as a family to the places that God sent us. And we can't do it all the time, as you see this morning, but um, when we first started student, the student church movement, um, my wife looked at me and she says, we had a six-month-old baby, and she says, this is God. I don't care about this house. I don't care about stability. Let's get in the car and go. We got in a minivan, and that first few months in, in helping pioneer this movement, we traveled 10,000 miles as a family to make disciples and start churches on college campuses. So my wife is my, my partner in kingdom business, and I love her and my best friend, and, and I'm sad she couldn't be here this morning. I want to talk with you about the call to be a fisher of men. I want to start off with a couple scriptures. I'm going to tell you a few stories and hopefully jazz up your spirit for what's already inside you if you're a follower of Jesus. One of my passions in life is, is, is I can't stand it when, when, when uh, sometimes you'll start to feel guilty about what you're supposed to be doing rather than inspired by what Jesus has already done. And then out of an overflow of that, walking out of the passion and the energy and the love and the joy that the Holy Spirit flows through us. I want to end with some practical equipping and then call you from the office of an evangelist to the work of fishing for people as a lifestyle. Not an artificial, annoying, you know, TV... Of, you know, not being an evangelist like maybe the stereotype is, but out of an overflow of your walk with Jesus, seeing that spread in the places that you do life. When Jesus was starting his earthly ministry, if we could read this in Mark, he goes along the lake shore, and you know, I think it's significant that Jesus spent 30 years of his life really not doing a lot that we know about, except business. Jesus was a businessman. Before, he was an evangelist, an apostle, and a prophet, and a teacher, and a pastor, and king, and lord, and messiah, and everything else. He was a businessman. When he started his earthly ministry, he heard God the Father say, I am well pleased with you, my beloved son. The starting of every work in ministry should always be out of an overflow of knowing God the Father loves you. He's pleased with you. You're his son. You're his daughter. That's the foundation of your relationship with God. So when Jesus starts his earthly ministry, he's walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee in Mark 1, and he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. They were businessmen. Jesus called out to them, come follow me. Another translation says, come be my disciple. Come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed them. Just stay there, please. What is the first thing that Jesus says is going to typify your life when you become his follower? He'll show us how to fish. I sometimes have uh, young men from other ministries uh, ask me, say, will you disciple me? Will you disciple me? And I say, I will, on one condition. You first go find three lost people you find out their spiritual story, you pray for them, you tell them how Jesus changed your life, and then you come talk to me. Because fundamentally, I don't believe that it's possible to be a disciple of Jesus 
without intentionally having your life steered toward fishing for people. There is no discipleship without evangelism. Let's read the next scripture. Chapter later in Mark 2. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. What a great lot of people to be associated with. But when the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? And Jesus replied, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know that they are sinners. You know, I believe fundamentally that the gospel works most powerfully through uneloquent speech and authentic, ordinary people. Religious people have never been very good at either understanding Jesus or re-presenting Him to the world. One of my friends pioneered a concept called dinners with sinners. <laughs> Did you have your dinner with, dinners with sinners this week? I want to ask you, when is the last time you engaged in a meal, in interaction, conversation with scum? I remember when I was, uh, the Lord gave us the honor uh, four years ago of being adopted um, by the Dakota Sioux Nation. And as a white man, it was quite an honor. And we, uh, my wife and I, went to Haskell Indian Nations University. It was the first place that we started a, um, a training school called Student CPX, if you wouldn't mind throwing that up there. It's the second slide. Uh, the number two slide, I believe. We started our first student CPX at Haskell University, and the vision was to start a repro reproducible school for training disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. We started at Haskell University, and in four years, we're now to almost 2,000 student missionaries equipped, representing 400 university campuses. And I remember four years ago sitting in Pastor David's office crying and saying, I think I'm supposed to start this thing and I don't know how it looks and we lost our ministry and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, hey man, I'm with you. If it's God, it will, it will multiply. If it's not, you'll starve. But then I'll pick you up and we'll still be with you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> but when, we, when, I was sent, when I went to Haskell... There are 130 different tribal nations um, represented there. I consider it a travesty that in the United States, which is so Christianized, the first people who lived here were some of the least evangelized. I love the heritage and the legacy of the United States as a godly nation founded on godly principles, but we also have a couple very distinct black eyes of injustice. Native Americans and African Americans. God is in the business of taking the least and making them the greatest. God is taking, in the business of taking what the world considers foolish and raising them up to astound the wise. I love discipling Native Americans. I love discipling African Americans. They've been some of the strongest leaders that I've seen come out of our ministry. And when we were at Haskell, I didn't know what to do, so I got a really inspired, amazing, Holy Spirit strategy for making disciples at Haskell. You want to hear what it is? I would go eat with people. And so one day I walk up into the cafeteria and I notice everybody has to have a, you know, a name tag and an ID and everything. I'm like, I'll just see what happens. I'll just walk in. 
and they go, I go, hey, anything I need to do? They go, oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. They just welcomed me as a guest. Well, Jesus said in Luke 10, when they welcome you, eat what's set before you. Jesus knew that eating with people was going to be a very simple kingdom strategy for discipling the nations. Because eating with people is often the starting point for relationship and meaningful interaction. You see, you see what I'm doing this morning? I'm trying to take this grandiose evangelism, intense, you know, scary, pass out tracks, and, yeah, and, and make it simple. Okay? Because the gospel works most powerfully when it's simple. Paul said... Uh, to the Galatians, I, I'm afraid someone's bewitched you, deceived you from moving away from the simplicity of Jesus. Dude, I love Jesus. He's changed my life. He's forgiven me for a lot of stuff. I love him. Even when I'm doing bad, he picks me up. When I'm doing great, he says, don't get too high on yourself, but I'm still proud of you, son. You know, some of us, I think, we don't, Communicate Jesus in our lives and our conversations because maybe you've forgotten how good He is. What He's like. What it's like when you feel Him. Some of us have become so immersed in what I call churchianity that we've forgotten the basic things what it means to follow Jesus and love Him and treat people like He treated the adulterous woman. Hey, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not going to hold back from the truth, but I'm not here to condemn you. Get up. Let's walk together. So I was sitting in the cafeteria one day, eating, and this counselor that I'd built a relationship with, she was not a Christian woman. She was an Apache spiritualist, kind of a polytheistic worldview. I'd had spiritual conversations with her. She'd invited me to teach a couple of her classes. She storms through the cafeteria doors and she says, Eric, Eric, I need you. And a student is kind of following behind her and she grabs the student and introduces him to me and she says, this is Eric. He has the power of God within him. He will pray for you and your problem will go away. <laughs> she wasn't a Christian. But because I had put myself in a place to engage in dialogue with people where they eat and just fully represent Jesus, but just in dialogue. It makes space for powerful Holy Spirit things to happen right where people are living and doing life and sinning and hurting. One of my life passions, I, I love the church. One of my passions is to see the church be fruitful in the marketplace, in the education system, and in the homes, in the places that we do life together. And this is the hour for the church of the harvest to be sent and equipped for the work of ministry. You are a, a ticking time bomb waiting to be released, and now is the hour of release. I'm going to tell a couple other stories. I, uh, I was in Austin, Texas a couple weeks ago, and uh, I was with some, some friends uh, named Tony and Felicity Dale, and uh, Tony, they were both medical doctors in England, and he told me a story. They started a, uh, just a little, little ministry to equip doctors to have spiritual conversations with their patients. Very, very simple concept. They gave them some basic tools, some basic trainings, just with the vision of we want to have conversations about Jesus with our patients and pray for them when it is appropriate. Now, you, you know, God, God loves doctors. God's a healer. I believe in miraculous healing, and I praise God for doctors. Medical doctors and miraculous healing are on the same team. They can work together for the same goal. And so one, uh, one year after they started this program, one of the medical doctors that was in their program um, chronicled every spiritual conversation he had with his patients over the course of a year. And he, when he reported the findings, he said, I had 152 spiritual conversations over the course of a year with my patients. Of those 152 conversations, one-third of them, around 50, gave their life to Jesus immediately on the spot. 
Another third of them became followers of Jesus after subsequent conversations. After, after six months, the, the second third of them became followers of Jesus. And the other third he just lost track with and didn't know what happened. So out of 152 spiritual conversations about Jesus in the marketplace, two-thirds of them became followers of Jesus. From a medical doctor. A medical doctor led over 100 people to Jesus in one year just by simply introducing conversations about Jesus with them. I'm going to tell a couple more stories. Another time I was eating at a little barbecue at Haskell, and I meet a young man named Josiah. He had maybe read the Bible a couple times, was very, very young in the things of God. And uh, if you could go to that uh, second slide with the pictures of the two Native Americans on it. And I started meeting with Josiah, and Josiah got baptized. And I looked at Josiah and I said, this is what I do when I disciple young men. I say, you know what? After I lead him to Christ, I say, I see a lot of potential in you for leadership. I'd like to spend some time intentionally just building our relationship, teaching you what I know, and helping you become a stronger leader who can influence others for Jesus. Would you like that? And they're usually like, yes! Man, young people are crying out, dying for someone who's a spiritual father to believe in them and train them and equip them and send them and release them. So I said, okay, I ask five things of, of people that I disciple. Uh, one is that um, you spend time with Jesus every day. It's got to be the foundation of your relationship with God is spending time with Jesus every day. You commit to live sexually pure. You commit to intentionally build a closer relationship with me, letting me mentor you and coach you and speak into your life. Four, you commit that you will regularly gather with other disciples. Church. Five, that you will immediately start making other disciples based on what you're, we're learning in our times together. I ask those five commitments of every person I disciple. So Josiah committed to this, and he made a list of every lost person that he knew on his campus who was, uh, he was believing to become a follower of Jesus. One of the people on his list was his roommate. Now his roommate, coincidentally, or God-adently, happened to be a demon-possessed Satan worshiper. Sometimes in the middle of the night, Josiah would wake up and his roommate would be chanting in demonic tongues over him while he slept. He would get out of his room sometimes in trances and wander around the campus, and he wouldn't remember it. He would go around saying things like, I am death. I am death. He was totally demon-possessed. Jo jo Josiah starts playing worship music in his dorm room. He starts um, telling him just stories about Jesus. He starts planting the seeds of the gospel. And one day, a few months later, I pick up Josiah for um, a, a discipleship appointment, and I walk in, and, and his, this, his roommate is there. And I don't know why I did it. I can't even say I had a word of the Lord. But I said, hey, man, how you doing? He goes, okay. I go, dude, did you know that Jesus has a purpose for your life? <laughs> he said, really? It's amazing how powerful the simple introduction of Jesus is to people. I said, yeah, do, you know, if you become a follower of Jesus, he'll break off chains of like demonic spirits and stuff that torment your life, and he'll help lead you in the purpose you were created for. I go, D do you want to become a follower of Jesus right now? He pauses. He goes, yes, I do. You know, even the garrison demoniac had enough will left in him to bring himself to the feet of Jesus. I love demon-possessed people. I don't like demons. They're really nasty and ugly. They torment people's lives. But I love seeing people set free. I believe the best picture in Scripture of an evangelist we have is Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He anointed me to preach good news to the poor. To bind up the brokenhearted. 
to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, to set captives free. I introduce Jesus to people, one, because he's the truth, but two, because he makes people's lives better. Gives us purpose. It's, it's, he makes our lives better. So Josiah's roommate gave his life to Jesus. He started casting out demons. His eyes started rolling back in the back of his head. And he gets baptized. This is a picture of him at his baptism with Josiah. Started reading the Bible. You know, honestly, when you're, when you're bringing the Gospel to where the darkness is, sometimes it's messy. After a few weeks... An old girlfriend came up to him and said, you're the ugliest guy. I will never be with you. And like cursed him. He got so hurt, he started blaming God and really struggled in his faith afterwards. And praying for his you know, ongoing restoration. It's messy, guys. We live in a messy world. Even Johnson County is messy. Yeah, you know it, you know? I want to tell one more story. Is that Okay. I'm going to leave you with a practical, simple steps and then facilitate a call to respond to what God is saying this morning. At the University of Texas, one of the young ladies who went through student CPX named Megan, if you could go to the next slide, went to her campus. And we train students to go in to preach the gospel, make disciples, and form little discipleship communities where people meet for fellowship, for discipleship, for worship, for word, for communion. They baptize new believers. It's basically a simple expression of the church for a college campus that any student on any campus in the world can start anywhere. And so Megan um, goes to her campus and she starts praying for her brother, Michael, who is a freshman. Michael was an atheist and a druggie, living in a drug, druggie house, was dealing drugs. And one day... One of her friends calls her and says, I had a dream about you last night that you were baptizing your brother in the town lake in Austin. So she takes this and just, yes, I believe it's going to happen. A couple weeks later, her brother calls her and says, would you come get me from jail? I got arrested for a charge. She goes and picks him up from jail. That night, they start talking in the car, and she says, can I just, can I just pray for you? You know, I know you don't believe in God, but Jesus has changed my life, and he can help you. And he goes, okay, I'll let you pray for me. So she prays for him. He starts crying. She says, I tell you what, would you want to get together and just read some stories about Jesus over coffee? Just Let's just read some stories about Jesus. He goes, yeah, I'd like that. They go back that night and they read some stories about Jesus. After that, they meet again later that week. They meet the week after that. She brings a few friends along with her and they continue to read Jesus stories. And after a couple weeks, Michael gives his life to Jesus, gets baptized in the Holy Spirit, starts speaking in tongues, and was baptized by her brother in Town Lake, along with a crowd of people watching. These are students. These are ordinary, well, I think they're extraordinary, but they're authentic people. The group in Austin has, has started about 10 simple churches. And they consider themselves just a, a, a larger spiritual family of churches. People getting saved, baptized, delivered, following Jesus. After six months of walking with Jesus, Michael said, I want to go back into my druggie house and start a church. He goes into his druggie house. He gathers a, a group of his friends and they start reading stories about Jesus in a hookah bar. Hey, Jesus hung out in a lot of weird, wrong places. I'm not embarrassed to say I'm willing to go and see Jesus go where the church is not. Je Jesus has this amazing way of being like totally holy and really close to sinners at the same time. You ever notice that? But Jesus is really cool. I want to live like that. A year after Michael became a follower of Jesus... They're in a prayer room, and one of their friends, Lauren, hears the word Bhutan. She didn't know what it was. Someone tells her it's a country. So she looks on a map, finds out where it is, and says, I feel like I'm supposed to go to Bhutan. A week later, someone walks up to her and says, hey, I'm going to Bhutan. Do you want to go with me? This really happened. All my stories are true. 
I don't believe in evangeladuration. <laughs> so, you, know, you know what evangeladuration? It's like, it's true, it's just evangelist exaggerated. Okay, now these are true. So Lauren gets Michael and Megan and a, a few other students in their student church community there, the King Street Church, and they go to the border of Bhutan and they do a student CPX there, training 41 Bhutanese students to travel across their country, making disciples and starting simple churches in the villages. One day they go out on a thing we call a treasure hunt, which is like you go out and you pray and you try to get little clues for where the Holy Spirit's leading you, and then you look at your list and you go to the places. Well, they go out one day and they see this, this married couple, and they start a conversation about Jesus with them. It's a Hindu couple. They get scared and run away. The following day, they go out on another treasure hunt, and one of them has a vision of a house, and she describes the house, and they write it down on a piece of paper. They're walking through the town, and she sees the house that she had in her vision when she was praying. She goes, that's the house. So they go up to the house. They knock on the door. And the couple that had ran away from them the previous day, it was their house. They get scared again, but this time they repent and they become followers of Jesus. They throw out their Hindu idols and they get baptized. These are students leading people to Jesus, making disciples, going to the nations. The call to follow Jesus is a call to be a fisher of men. I'm going to leave you with four practical steps. I like to use the analogy of salt. How to encounter and engage people. Some of you feel afraid. It's like, how do I do this? I don't want to... I, I, I hate this stereotype of evangelism. I really... It, it's, I'm passionate about it. I love to see ordinary people introducing an extraordinary God with a powerful Holy Spirit and an amazing, passionate love wherever they are. There's a simple tool I, I use. Salt. Start a conversation. You're in the workplace. You're in school. Hey, do you, you want to eat together today? Hey, tell me, um, do you have a spiritual background? Have you ever had any spiritual experiences? Sometimes I ask, um, did you know that God has a great purpose for your life? Actually, I say that a lot. Next, A, ask questions. And I'd encourage you to write this down if you're to remember this. Ask questions. And sometimes Christians become, we can become so great at telling all the answers. Did you ever notice how many questions God asks in the Bible? The first thing he said to man after the fall was a question. Where are you? Did he not know? He asks questions to, to, to get the response of the human heart because God is into relationship. He's been asking the same question ever since to every human that has ever been born on the planet. Bound by sin. Captured by demonic forces, broken hearted by the pains of life. Where are you? Oh, oh, I'm alone and I'm hiding, and my clothes really are not adequate. I need someone to pull me out of here. I need a relationship with you. Thanks for asking me where I was. Ask questions. Tell me about your background. Do you have a, have, a, have you had any spiritual experiences? And they'll tell about how they've been burned by church or how they've never you know, had a good experience with, with Christians, or they've never heard. Many times when I'm re talking with international students, they've never heard of Jesus. We had a student in our, in our movement who told me, Eric, I've met a lot of people who haven't heard the gospel, but this year with one of the international students I met, he had never heard the name Jesus before. Never heard the, about the historic person of Jesus. Next, listen. This is so simple. Listen, hear their heart, hear what's going on. Lastly, tell your story. Tell your story, your personal story with Jesus. Well, hey, can I tell you about my experience with Jesus? Did you notice that at this point, up to this point, 
I haven't invited anyone to come to church. Okay, I'm, all right, I'm just going to lay it out there. Most sinners do not need to be invited to church. They need to be invited to Jesus. Then when they start following Jesus, then they're added to the church. Start inviting people to Jesus as the primary operative question of your, mission of your life, and the church will grow as a result. Start a conversation, ask questions, listen, tell your story with Jesus. So I start to close, do, we need, do you want the worship band up here? I just want to facilitate a response, and I'm going to just keep it real, because when I was 20 years old, someone challenged me to answer the call to be a disciple, to come catch for people, and my decision to follow Jesus was simultaneous with the call to become a fisher of men. And I saw what was on this guy's life from the Holy Spirit. He was so real, he was so authentic. I was like, I want to follow Jesus like that. 